Welcome to today's webinar, uh, Assistive Technology and Remote Support Options. I'm Sean Henderson, and I serve as the Systems Analytics Manager at Hammer Residences. I'm one of the original members of our host group for today, uh, the Minnesota Networking and Education and Assistive Technology, uh, or as we like to call ourselves, Minnesota NEAT. Uh, a good many of us, myself included, are also part of the ARM Technology Resource Center work group. And a big shout out to ARM for allowing us to use their Zoom system uh, for today's event. Uh, very, very nice of them. I'll just be helping out today by providing this brief introduction, uh, moderating some questions and making sure we don't get too lost in the weeds. Uh, many of the items and concepts we'll talk about during this presentation will be available at the Minnesota NEAT website and the ARM Technology Resource Center. A little extra information about both of those. Uh, the ARM Technology Resource Center is an excellent information guide for service providers, case managers, families, or self-advocates. It contains introductions to using technology as well as outlines and documentation for how you can implement it. Uh, for case managers and service providers alike, that can look like uh, how to start the conversation, uh, what are my funding options, what are good ways of actually getting that technology in for the person. It's a great resource. Uh, Minnesota NEAT, uh, we were formed uh, in 2015 as a collaboration among providers and vendors to educate others and share our thoughts on the use of assistive technology. Uh, since then, we've used our connections and expertise to help uh, uh, AM, or excuse me, <laughs> to help contribute content for the Technology Resource Center, as well as organize events like this to share out information. Uh, we aim to educate and connect caregivers and individuals with resources, contacts, and solutions to help grow independence through the use of technology. If you scroll up in the webinar chat, uh, you'll find links for both the Minnesota NEAT website and the ARM Technology Resource Center. Uh, both are really great introductions uh, to the use of assistive technology and remote support options, which is a perfect segue into today's topic. Uh, we've got a number of experts from around the state to field questions and present some quick presentations on assistive technology and remote support options. Uh, a couple things about just the overall procedure here. We'll start things off and have 40 minutes of presentations sliced up into five minute segments for all of our panelists here. Um, then in the last 45 minutes, we'll be fielding your questions, uh, both for the uh, presenters here, as well as a number of panelists that we have on. Um, I'll be keeping attendees muted. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how that operates for all the attendees, but if you do end up taking yourself off of mute, please make sure that you put yourself back on. Uh, it's just a really easy way for us to get distracted and lose where we are. Um, let's see. Just a quick note, as we go through these presentations, uh, if you look down at the bottom of your Zoom panel, you'll see two little chat bubbles uh, that say Q&A underneath it. Uh, if you click on that, it'll open up the Q&A channel and you'll be able to see any open questions. Uh, that will allow uh, our panelists to answer them as they come in, if we know the information. And our presenters at the end, I'll be posing those questions uh, once we get into the Q&A session. So uh, once again, make sure that you utilize that Q&A as much as possible. That way we have a wealth of stuff that we can go through. Um, let's see what else I'm missing here because I miss everything all the time. Uh, introducing our panelists, so myself, Sean Henderson from Hammer Residences. We also have Kit Peltingsrud from Living Well Disability Services, Bridget Gillermini from Forbes AAC, and Kate Ingalls Maloney from Cassia. And like I said, we'll be fielding your questions if we can as they come in. Otherwise, we'll be flagging them for our presenters as we go through everything else. So with that said, Let's go ahead and get into some of our presentations for today. We'll start off with Anna McIntyre, who is the waiver policy lead at Minnesota DHS. Anna, can you take it away? Yes, hi, um, I'm Anna McIntyre and I am the disability lead, uh, the, the lead for disability services division on technology. And um, I am also a member of Minnesota NEAT. And so I wanted to um, just share a few things. I'm going to share my screen here so I can first show you, and we can post this um, too after the webinar, but um, oftentimes it gets a little confusing regarding um, 
how to fund technology because we do have a lot of different services that fund uh, technology or support technology, which includes both assistive technology and remote support. Um, and so I wanted to just um, uh, do a little plug for our CBSM manual, our community-based services manual pages that are specific to technology or technology-related services. So um, the document here is, is linked, but I won't go and take the time to go into um, all the individual links right now. But what I would do is encourage you to just spend a few minutes um, looking at each of these different service pages because they, although they all do fund technology um, or remote supports in some way, they kind of do so a little bit differently. It might depend on which waiver someone's on or the capacity in which the equipment's being used, whether it's um, for assistive technology purposes or for providing as a means to provide remote support monitoring. So um, there are some different nuances. So I would encourage you to take a look at these pages and then um, always just, uh, if you have questions about any of these pages or questions that come up as to how to, um, what might be the most appropriate service to use um, in different situations, then you can feel free to, to contact me and we can, we can walk through that, which I, I do um, fairly frequently in my position. So feel free to do that. I'll also just mention briefly too that there is um, state plan funding too that funds um, equipment that can be considered durable medical equipment. So I have some examples of what would be included under there um, and kind of uh, some criteria that the, the equipment has to be met. So if it can be built under state plan, um, the waiver always always requires that that be done first. But um, if not, which many things can't be, then that's where a lot of the different waiver services above um, come in. And then there are also um, some additional resources that might either uh, lend or fund or demonstrate different uh, technology options. Um, so there's a list of, of those here, um, as well as, um, some more sites that are more informational um, and that can provide people um, even just many more resources than what's listed here, as well as some like how-to information. And um, you know, if you're wondering about a specific type of technology and you're wondering you know, what other people who've used that technology uh, think of it or recommendations, there's information on that as well. Um, so we can make this available um, after the webinar, but I just wanted to draw your attention to it because like I said, we do have a lot of different services that, that fund technology and it, and it can be a little confusing, um, which is understandable because we've, um, although we've been working on increasing our training efforts around technology, there, we still have a long way to go with that. Um, so I'd also just like to uh, talk about a couple other, and I can just stop sharing my screen now too. Um, or maybe I can't. Do you want to stop me, Sean? <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so a couple other things that, um, I like to make sure that I can share with people when I have the opportunity, just because I think there is some confusion around it, is that um, a lot of times I think case managers feel that there has to be, um, like if before they could authorize something that that is to help with somebody increasing their independence, that the person has to be um, either living in their own home or getting ready to move into their own home. Um, sometimes, you know, the thought is that, well, they don't need, they don't need that piece of equipment because they have staff available on site that can um, help them with that. Um, and I always like to just um, help people realize that that's, that the, to remember that the overall goal is to increase people's 
independence and decrease their over reliance on staff in general like that's just like one of our overall ultimate goals and so if someone were to be able to learn how to use a device to administer their own medications for example um, that's uh, a big piece of ownership for that person and it's also um, a skill that would be great for that person to have um, you know we can't just say that we want people to that you know we will wait till someone's ready to live on their own because um, they're not going to get that chance to be ready if we don't have these small steps along the way um, or if someone could get an environmental control that could allow them to turn their own lights on and off or their own music on and off um, we shouldn't be saying that they have staff available <laughs> to do that for them um, because that 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 might be true they might have staff that that could do that for them but um, you know we want to um, for one empower them to be able to do those things for themselves um, we need to be able to maximize staff's time um, so that they can focus on things that really truly need to be done by a staff person um, and then also just if um, you know I know when I want my lights turned off I want my lights <laughs> turned off and I and if there was a piece of equipment cheap equipment at that that could allow me the ability to do so I would want that versus maybe having to wait 20 minutes while my staff finished putting my housemate to bed or what have you um, to get my <laughs> to get my lights turned off um, so I always try to kind of point out those those kind of everyday things that that can um, mean a lot to people um, all right thank you Anna let's uh, yeah. We'll save some of those. We've already got some good questions coming through. Okay. So uh, thank you so very much for that quick presentation. And we'll come back to some of those items that you've touched on in a little bit. Uh, Chanel from Southeastern Minnesota Center for Independent Living. If you want to unmute yourself, we can get you started here. Yes, so um, can everybody hear me? Let me see. Can everybody, am I unmuted? Yep, you're good to go. Oh, perfect, perfect. Okay, so thank you, Sean. Um, again, my name is Chanel, and I am Stem Sills AT Specialist, as well as a member of Minnesota NEAT. I want to thank everyone that has joined this webinar and for the opportunity to discuss some of the services that Stem Sill, Smiles, and Swistle continue to provide at this time. While recommendations are changing daily, SILs are continuing to operate during this COVID-19 pandemic by implementing various safety measures. I'm gonna share how our three centers for independent living are providing AT supports so that we can continue to empower people with disabilities to accomplish their goals. At SEMSIL, we are Current, we currently house, um, let me move this out of the way. We currently house over 80 AT devices within our lab. Um, while AT services vary from SIL to SIL, between the three SILs that are presenting in today's webinar, we are providing demonstrations. So showing how a device works as well as, you know, being able to compare device features. That is being done in person as well as on a virtual platform. We are conducting short-term loans, so being able to trial a device up to 30 days to see if a device meets a person's needs. Um, devices can be picked up in our office. Uh, we are able to mail out devices to people's homes. We have also made accommodations um, to actually drop devices off for people at their homes. So when we um, are doing our short-term loans, we are offering follow-up calls. Um, also virtual meetings that are made available so that we can answer any questions and help people troubleshoot while they have those devices in their home. Assessive, uh, assistive technology assessments are currently conducted on a case-by-case -case basis. So at this time, we are not going into people's homes, um, but if a referral comes through, what we're doing is kind of gathering information. What does that person need? Um, 
and, and checking their ability to do a virtual assessment. If that's not something that can be accomplished, we will put them on the wait list and, and be sure to connect with them so we can, again, meet their needs. While our offices are closed to the public, we are arranging in-person appointments, but we do so following various safety measures. So I, I know open lines of communication. What I mean by that is that when we're setting up meetings, I want everybody to know that if you're not feeling well, if I'm not feeling well, go ahead and give me a call that day because we can easily reschedule. Um, when scheduling in-person appointments, what I'm doing now is I'm asking people to give me a call when they get to our parking lot so that I can go ahead and meet them up front and take them right back to the lab to, to reduce the number of people that would be up front at any given time. We talk about face masks. I'm wearing a face mask. Um, if people have a face mask they want to wear, um, we encourage that. We have also at our at our Center for Independent Living, we have a number of volunteers that are donating face masks at that time too. So if somebody doesn't have one and wants one, we're able to um, check our supply and, and get them in contact with one. We talk about hand washing. So again, when we're going into the lab, I ask people, you know, to wash their hands in the bathroom or I've got some hand sanitizer in the lab. Uh, when devices that have been loaned out are returned, we want to make sure that those are thoroughly disinfected when they, when they come back. So we have got medical grade sanitizing wipes that we use as well as um, a UVC light wand sanitizer. While we know that everyone's needs are different, some of the recently requested AT devices have been live scribe and reading pens for transition age youth because of distance learning. Um, I've been getting calls from parents and VR counselors inqu inquiring about these devices. So here on this slide, I have listed some of the devices that we have in-house at SEMSIL. Consumers who rely on their PCAs and volunteers are also being affected during this time and that they don't have the same access um, or it's not as consistent as it once was. So uh, we have been able to loan out multiple magnifiers at this time for, for some consumers in need. Howard from Smiles shared that his primary population that he provides AT supports to are senior citizens that are in need of technology that allows them to stay in contact with family, as well as blind and low vision devices. Parents and guardians are calling to inquire about iPads and technology like Alexa and Ring that will aid in their family members' ability to remain in their home safely, as well as enable them to communicate with friends and family. So I've been receiving calls um, from parents for their children, as well as their, their senior parents um, for these devices. SEMSIL has partnered with the STAR program, and we are currently housing their OB dining robot, which is a device that helps individuals who have upper extremity limitations. So this was really neat experience in that I was able to conduct a um, virtual demonstration for an individual, and based on that demonstration, they determined that they would like to take out a short-term loan. We were able to make arrangements to actually have that device delivered to that person's home. And then I was setting up weekly, sometimes twice, Twice a week virtual meetings with that individual and their PCA to help them get the device set up to do any troubleshooting and answer any questions throughout their short term loan. All right, let's uh, let's move onward and upward. Thank you so much, Chanel. Super interesting stuff about the that dining robot there. Really, really neat. Uh, Let's see, we've got Adam Chandler from uh, Southwestern Minnesota Center for Independent Living. All right, thank you, Sean. Um, my name is Adam Chandler. I'm uh, the program manager for our AT department and our uh, RAMP program uh, over here at the Southwestern Center for Independent Living. And I just kind of wanted to talk to you briefly about um, some of the platforms and some of the ways that we are um, continuing to communicate, uh, set up meetings um, to be uh, as active with our consumers as possible. Um, so, you know, we're doing all sorts of different things, utilizing all sorts of different platforms to continue to have meetings, to continue to have face-to-face um, -face visits or virtual face-to-face -face visits with our, um, with our consumers. We're utilizing uh, platforms such as Zoom, uh, Google Hangouts, Facebook Messenger, um, 
go to meetings, all these platforms to utilize uh, remote services. Um, we're mailing documents, we're emailing documents, we're faxing documents to the consumers um, so that they can have all of the information available. Um, so they can, it, even though we can't be there in person, um, once they get the documents, we can set up a Zoom meeting, we can set up um, a, a phone call to help them fill out those documents, help them get all that information ready to go. Um, so they could submit it to uh, county, county workers or back to uh, the independent living centers. And like Chanel had said, you know, every, little, every independent living center runs a little bit differently, but overall, um, what we're doing is basically the same. I encourage you that if you are, uh, if you are looking for uh, AT services or ramp services, or even some of our independent living services to give us a call, um, and you know we can step you through it all of our services are still currently not just at and our ramps but all of our services are currently still operational and doing whatever we can to keep in contact uh with our consumers on a daily monthly weekly basis um and yeah like chanel said that you know we do have we are putting together and we do have instructional videos on how to navigate zoom and navigate google hangouts um and to navigate Facebook Messenger so we can utilize whatever services are most, or whatever platforms are most comfortable for the consumer. Um, so we can get that positive contact with them. So we can do those preliminary assessments. So we can do those um, pre-evaluation um, stuff that, like that. Uh, briefly, um, our independent living services, our CDCS, uh, WIOA, all of those services are still um, working uh, tirelessly to make sure that the consumer has everything that they that that we can offer them. Um, so uh, with that, um, we are still hosting uh, virtual um, virtual trainings, virtual classes, uh, transitional service classes. Um, you know, we're setting up uh, a tutorial classes and stuff like that um, to keep uh, keep things flowing, and so consumers can have uh, have that information available to them at any time. Um, so yeah, I just uh, that's pretty much all I have. Um, I kind of shortened it up here so we can move keep moving along, but uh, we'll answer any questions at the end of this. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. All right, Howard, Smile Center for Independent Living. Okay, I hope everybody can hear me. Again, my name's Howard Broston. I'm the ATP and Ramp Program Manager for Smiles. We're located in Southern Minnesota, South Central Minnesota. Um, I was asked to talk about ramps and home accessibility. And with warm weather coming now, it's getting to be, um, a lot of people are wanting to get out. Uh, so we're, our ramp program is getting uh, in high gear. Uh, I was out yesterday, set one ramp up. I took two down. I'm going out this afternoon for another one, and I have more to put up. Um, real briefly, uh, our ramp program, we have two different programs now. We have our modular wood program and our temporary metal ramp program. The Modular wood ramp program is primarily for people who need ramps long term, longer than a few months or something like that. Uh, many years ago, we started the rental program with metal ramps. Uh, we were getting a lot of inquiries from individuals, families, uh, care providers, um, anybody and everybody, uh, people looking for ramps. They didn't need something long term. So that led to our starting a rental program. We rent out ramps. Uh, I've got a few pictures here. I'm gonna try and share this. Aha, uh -huh, there it goes. Um, this is just an example of some of the ramps we put up. Uh, many situations we have gone out and set up a metal, pro metal ramp for a family uh, as this one here. We did this in the winter. Uh, the following spring we built a wood one, uh, which will look like this. Um, this comes in real handy. Our metal ramp program 
Uh, we use that many times for families who have a loved one recovering from surgery, illness, hospice, uh, seniors. Um, in this case, uh, somebody it was too late in the year to build a wood one. We built this one up and built a wood one the following spring. Um, it's been a real, real popular program. Uh, we offer these at, and I think this is true with both Rochester and Marshall. Uh, we offer these at very nominal prices. It's very affordable and we're willing to work with people who are in need of ramps to make it uh, affordable. Um, in addition to ramps, we also get into home accessibility, uh, grab bars, um, uh, lift chairs, home assessments, just depending on what the situation is. Uh, many times we get individuals or families, care providers, who really don't know what they're looking for or where to start. And uh, we're a good resource for that type of information. Uh, we can offer suggestions uh, and resources. If it's something that we can't do, we can find the people to help do that. Um, I could talk on and on about all these pictures here, um, but I'll stop. Uh, if people have more questions, I'd be happy to answer them at a later point, or they can contact us, or through the chat, or whatever. So, at that point, I will stop. Great, yeah, and just remember, everyone, uh, there's a number of questions that have come in so far, but down on the bottom ribbon, uh, you'll see the little double chat bubble, uh, and uh, if you click there, you'll be able to ask some questions. Uh, you'll also be able to see all of them, too, if uh, there's an interesting one that's already been answered. All right, next up, we've got Elena Gallagher from Dose Health. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me all right? <laughs> awesome. Um, so, yeah, my name is Elena. I am from Dose Health. So, we are a company that's covered through all Medicaid waiver programs, specifically um, most of our services are focused on really helping people become more independent and involved. Um, so the, the thing I'm mainly going to talk with you about today is a medication dispenser that we provide. So our medication dispenser is the Dose Flip, and some of you guys may be familiar with it, but it's this little guy here. So it is a fully portable med dispenser. It has a three to four day battery life. So our intent is really to help tackle the medication adherence problem. It's a really big problem that, that oftentimes leads to people being hospitalized or need to be rehomed. Um, also, it's something that we've been doing a lot as a tool for independence for getting people more involved with their daily care. So if they do have staff taking care of them, it's a nice way for them to take back some control in their lives and be more independent. So the very simple way it works is it's scheduled for an individual's medication time. So if they take meds two times a day or something like that, at that scheduled time, it's going to automatically rotate open. Um, it looks kind of like this. And then I don't have the alarms turned on here because over webinar they sound just lovely, but the idea is it would sound an alarm and all they would have to do is pick it up and flip it over to dispense the medications. Um, by dispensing and flipping over the medications, that's actually what turns off the alarms. So we found that's been really important getting people to actually take their medications because sometimes when people respond to the alarms, they're just you know doing that step of, oh, I gotta turn off that alarm and they forget that next step to do it, which is actually taking medications in this circumstance. So um, we have it set to do everything really for them besides actually flipping itself over and giving them the medication, which they do have to do. Um, so yeah, like I said, it is fully covered by all the Medicaid waiver programs. The nice thing is in the background of the device, beyond just working with the individual to get them to take their medications, it does actually track that they're taking it. It can alert out to a family member or caregiver. We even have a lot of individuals themselves who like to receive the notifications. And those notifications can be anything from saying like, hey, it's been 30 minutes and you haven't taken your medications yet, to it's been two hours and the medications have officially been missed. This is just a way to keep the caregivers involved where they don't have to be, I like to say driving the car, they could be sitting in the back seat, still there with the individual helping them along. Um, we do have some adaptive equipment to make it easier for individuals to use. So I'm gonna 
just turn this down here and you guys can see that. So we've got an adaptive flipper. And the idea with this is we have a little piece in a med cup that slides under this just to make it really easy for somebody if picking up and flipping the device is difficult. They can just knock this over and it dumps right into the cup below it. Um, on top of that, something that we, we've always done but has been really useful, we've been seeing a lot more requests for it, is we've got extra trays. These can be pre-filled with medications in advance and easily just swapped in and out of the machine by the individual or a family member. And we can even do automated calls to remind people when it's time to swap, swap out the trays. This has been really helpful and I encourage, if any of you guys are working with individuals who already have our system set up, and you want these, this has been really great to help with socially distancing. Setting people up for med medications two weeks at a time has kept that 14-day window pretty solid. Um, and like I said, we can always do reminders or anything to, to let the individual remember to know to swap those out. Um, so with that in mind too, beyond the medication dispenser that we have, we also do health reminders. Um, and they've actually expanded into health and activity reminders. So we can essentially set up a phone call or a text message with any message in any language to an individual, reminding them to do literally anything, and we can ask for responses to know that they did it, and if they don't respond, we can set up a frequency that they keep getting reminded. And actually, that service we are doing for free. So no need for service authorization, no need for anything besides knowing who to send those to and what messages they want to receive, and that's until September 1st. Just in response to COVID, we hope that it can help keep people safe and socially distanced with the goal of not only to be keeping those individuals safe, but also to be keeping them hopefully out of the hospital, reducing the strain on the hospital system that is pretty strained right now. So um, if there's anything that we can do to help, please let us know. That's what we're here for. So yeah, I'll answer any questions during the, the Q&A session of this. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Elena. Uh, I will just say Hammer has been using the dose flips a lot and we just love them. All right. Next up, we've got Matt Hansen from Mercaric. If you could unmute yourself, sir. Or I will unmute for you. Or I won't. Sorry about that. Sean. There you are. I'm, I'm Matt Hansen with Mercaric Assistive Technology. I am an environmental accessibility specialist and an assistive technology professional. I just wanted to go through a couple of things today. And I've laid these out in the matter of time it takes to get the devices. First off, I wanted to touch on funding that uh, that we had spoken of before. There is funding available through the waiver for everything that we're talking about today, uh, either through the home uh, accessibility adaptions or through the assistive technology and codes. The coding is always going to be up to the case manager ultimately, um, but as assistive technology professionals, we can help lead you down the right path and get you there. So as I said, we're going to talk about things in a matter of time that it takes. The easiest and quickest thing to do to help a person out with independence and a bit of safety is wearables, things that they can bring around with them. The first watch that you're seeing is for children. It's the IGPS wizard watch. This is something that we can have out in just a few days and programmed uh, for a child. The PERS pendant, we can, depending on what time uh, you give us a call, we can have one of these to you uh, next day, or if you're in the Twin Cities area and it's an emergency, we can actually have it to you the same day, programmed, set up, so the people are safe and they can reach out to EMS and caregivers if needed. Uh, the third one we're seeing is an adult style watch and again, just a couple of days, SOS button on the watch, two-way communication on the watch. This one's great for seniors that we had mentioned before as well. The last one you're seeing on here is a rapid movement detection monitor, sometimes known as a seizure detection device. Uh, if you wanna know why I delineate between those two, uh, please give me a call on that. 
The, this can be provided in a few days as well. What we are going to need because it's an FDA approved device is a script or a prescription from uh, the person's primary physician or neurologist. Now I'm not gonna go too far into it, but seizure detection, we're talking about rapid movement uh, detection. So grand mal style seizure. The next thing that we're looking at here is sort of telemedicine and more specifically also uh, the nucleus device. The Nucleus device is a new iteration of it on, is on the market right now, and this is pretty exciting. What we can do is visual check-ins for people in their own homes uh, or in a group living style setting. You can program the device or we will program the device for you. Uh, when we talk about all of this, don't worry about having to know how to do any of it yourselves. There is going to be someone there either to do all of this for you or um, for lack of a better phrase, kind of hold your hand all the way through the process when it goes from billing to shipping to installation. Uh, as much as we don't wanna be in the home for the safety of the people concerned, uh, we can do 90% of this these days remotely. So we don't need to be there, but we can take care of all of this for you. So back to the remote check-ins, we can set different times on these devices to check in with the person. You're seeing smiley faces on the device. If the person answers good, great, so-so, well, we don't need a notification. But if they answer bad or awful, we can send a message directly to staff saying, give John a call. You'll also see a camera on the device. The camera has a slide on there if the person wants privacy to block the camera, but we can do two-way communication. Now, we may have talked about before that there is eating, easing on the guidelines for uh, HIPAA privacy in, in electronic devices. This one is HIPAA compliant for when the relaxed rules are enforced again. So there's something that we don't need to worry about. This device can be programmed to do oh so many things. I can't spend all of my time on it, uh, but give, give Merck Herrick a call or check out the website and, um, and we'll get back to you. On the telemedicine side of it, all kinds of different monitors, iPads, uh, tablet computers can be used for telemedicine with different sorts of applications. Telepsychiatry, reaching out to loved ones, reaching out to caregivers. There are a hundred different ways. Uh, at the end of the presentation, what I encourage you to do is reach out to a technology professional and just um, ask the questions. Just ask the questions, get a conversation started. And if we are not the right person to help you out, we're at least gonna get you going in the right direction and get you to the right person. So if you forget that it's Elena who is providing the dose help, go ahead and get, get a hold of Chanel or Adam and they're gonna get you to Elena. And same thing for Howard and Adam and the ramps. Uh, off the shelf devices. Off the shelf devices are available as fast as Amazon can get them to you. Uh, and on that actually, I'd call Best Buy these days because they're getting things out a lot faster, interestingly enough. Uh, but the Ring device Chanel had mentioned before, as well as a couple of other notification devices. We also have cameras that are available within the home. Off the shelf, alerts uh, such as sensors, pressure pads, bed pads, door alarms. Uh, we're gonna talk about those in just a second too, but all of these different notifications can be sent directly to caregivers. And with that, let's, uh, we'll, we'll leave some of those other options, I think for the Q and A, um, if that's all right, Matt. Sure. Awesome, yep, just uh, being mindful of time here to make sure that we can get uh, Sue Redepenning in. And Sue is with Live Life Therapy Solutions. For um, Technology for Home, which is a state grant through uh, DHS and uh, Live Life Therapy Solutions, the company that I own. I'm gonna try to screen share, but I don't know if you have to get Matt's off first. There we go. Okay, thanks. All right, so what I'm gonna be talking about today is how we're able to provide our services through remote uh, 
ways right now for the solutions that we offer. Let me just try to get this to go from the beginning. There we go. All right, so we are occupational therapists, physical therapists. Uh, we have a nurse with a assistive technology background. We have speech therapists and engineers. And we're able to offer a lot of the things that Matt was showing and everybody else has been talking about. We are the ones that do assessments and training. We don't sell any equipment, but we do the visits to make sure that the equipment that we're selecting is right for what the person's needs are. And right now we are offering almost all of our services remotely. Um, because we're therapists, if there is a need to go into the home or to bring something to the home, we're able to do it in a safe way, but we're really working hard to be remote and um, offer the same services in a new way to, to people so that we're really safe during this time. What we use um, is we use systems and tools to do our assessments and make sure that the person has the right tools before we do our assessment and that we train our therapists and we train the people that we're helping so that they have knowledge of what we're gonna be doing before we actually do the assessment. It's pretty scary the first time for people when they um, get on with um, someone if they haven't been prepped. So we're trying really hard, just like all of you guys are, to prep the person before we uh, do the service. Um, so what we're doing, um, I'm gonna go away from this and go back to, okay. So what we're doing is bringing the assessment to the person. Every one of the therapists that works for me has like a mini clinic in their um, home office. Um, and we're able to show the technology right from our offices um, to the person on the remote session. So we try really hard to have a video platform. The person can use their um, own phone, they can use a tablet, they can use a computer. And if the person doesn't have a tool, we are sending out an iPad for the person to be able to use to do the platform. Um, our platform is Teams, which is just like Zoom, but it's a Microsoft platform. We also can support FaceTime and Google Duo, any other uh, remote technology to introduce the person to how to do a remote session. We try to pick first something that person's familiar with. Um, once we get the person on remotely in a video, we can oftentimes then teach the person how to use Teams or how to use the platform um, that we'll want to use in future visits. Um, we can send technology and oftentimes are sending technology out before the visit so that we can actually try things at the visit. So we do have loan of equipment that we can send out. Um, I helped a family in Duluth, Minnesota from here, from um, the cities, and I sent them uh, an iPad with uh, switch access and the right switches, Bluetooth switches all set up before the session and they um, were able to remote on through that iPad and share their screen. And I did all of the training for that um, technology from here. And the person's been using that uh, iPad, that trial iPad for three weeks now. And last week I checked in with him and he was all smiles, totally beaming that he could do so much now with that that wants to get his own um, iPad and his own technology. And we haven't even met in person, but um, through the experiences, it really feels like we have. So if the remote technology is set up the right way and the person feels comfortable with it, the session can feel and look just like an in-person visit. So we're finding that we're able to do a lot through the remote technology that we never had thought was possible before. When we um, first got our state grant, um, our first contract was seven years ago, we did write in the use of remote technology to that. Um, and we've been using remote technology ever since. So we were sort of a little bit of ahead of the game when it came to training on assistive technology remotely. Um, and this just offered a new avenue for us to now experiment with all the different types of assessments we can offer this way. So our speech therapists are working with all the vendors for um, um, augmentative communication devices, and we're able to offer those remotely with the vendors. So the vendors are sending technology to the person's home ahead of time, and we're remoting onto that technology or onto technology that they have in the home. 
to be able to conduct the AAC assessment with a speech therapist and occupational therapist and the vendor present if all of those are needed. Physical therapists are offering durable medical equipment assessments and we're working with the providers to get the durable medical equipment set, set out ahead of time so we can still do the demos and the trials and everything um, via video. Um, and oftentimes not even sending someone there, the caregiver, the PCA is doing the um, demo assistance into the chair. And then we're able to do our whole assessment with the video. And we're doing the same with occupational therapy and um, setting up any, um, doing assessments for medical uh, dispenser devices, for off-the-shelf technology, for environmental control. So we've been pleasantly surprised that all of our services are continuing to happen and uh, the people that we're helping have really commented on how useful and helpful it's been. Um, I know that it, for our staff, our office staff spend time practicing with the person on the phone or on the remote technology prior to the visit so that everybody feels comfortable in the visit. And if you know the technology really well that you're helping the person with, um, then doing it in a video platform is, is not that much different once you get used to it. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. Time. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I've seen a number of questions come in about utilizing different supports. Um, we've got one uh, from Deb that asks, how do people access instructional videos for different virtual platforms? Uh, it looks like uh, Chanel's answered and Adam is putting some stuff together. If anybody else has uh, any information, let's see, we've got another one here on navigating Zoom meetings. So if, if anybody has just some general overview information on what Sue was just talking about here regarding Teams and if anybody's been doing anything aside from that. So like, I guess, like Sean said, we're, uh, Chanel has some informational tutorials on how to um, get Zoom meetings started. Um, I'm putting together some tutorials, uh, both in PDF, and I'm going to try and get a, uh, a recorded version um, set up for Google Hangouts and Facebook Messenger just to get people started on that. And once we can get them on the platform, then we can walk them through how to navigate certain options or certain different options of that platform. Um, so, and that's something we can definitely talk to anybody if they want to email me directly, we can get into more communications about that well about what they'd like to see. Right, and as we say that, I realize that it'd be great for those of us that are on a, a computer interface to see uh, some of that information. So uh, for those of you on the phone, I'm just showing the uh, contact information for those of us that are panelists and presenters for today. Um, a uh, quick note as we do move into the Q&A session, uh, we are recording this today and we'll try our best to get it out to everybody that's looking for it. Um, of course, you can feel free to share it with whoever you want to. Uh, and of course, our contact information will be listed here. You can also find uh, all of our contact information at the Minnesota NEAT website. That's mn-neat.org. Uh, so feel free to look us up there. All right, let's continue onward and upward. Some more questions here. So one uh, for Elena on the dose. Uh, do dose services include reminders other than medications? Hi, yes, that's a great question. Um, so what we have for non-pill medication reminders, essentially anything that can't go in the device, is we do automated phone call or text message reminders for individuals. Um, and that kind of falls into the free health reminders that we have available right now. Um, one of the things that we do for our services is we really like to make it flexible. So those reminders can be for, you know, those daily activities like needing to take insulin or liquid meds or fiber powders or topical medications, eye drops, all of that, 
But beyond that, it can also be used for things like paying your bills or walking your dog, going to the bathroom, really anything. Um, I stress that we've had people call us up and standardize like a personal message to their mom. One of my favorites was a son who wanted to just have a good morning and a good night message sent out to his mom every single day. And it was really lovely. So that's, that's a great one. Um, but really that message can be anything. It can be a reminder for literally anything. It does not have to be medication. And again, it can also be done in any language. And on top of that, it doesn't have to just be one message. We can actually set it up to call them every 15 minutes or every 30 minutes or every hour until they press one on a phone call to let us know that they did it and tracks that they did that activity and completed it. If it's a text message, we can set up the same thing and they just text back yes. If they don't, we can actually set it up too to notify a caregiver or family member that they haven't responded, which can trigger a family member to check in on them. On top of that, we've actually built out a system that allows us to do, essentially we call it a, like a remote two-way <laughs> uh, check-in where the individual can get the phone call saying, hey, we're just checking in to do, see if you're doing all right. If you're not, press two and you can be connected to and insert whoever they should be connected to, a family member, a caregiver, um, case manager if you guys want that, uh, anything like that. So just a reminder too, that is entirely free right now. That's not something that you have to submit service authorizations for. If you know anybody that can benefit from something like that, just let us know. You can email me directly. Um, you can email DOS, get on our website, whatever you want to do and we'll just get it set up. That's free until September 1st. We just wanted to do really even the smallest thing to help with COVID right now. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. So on that, on COVID and kind of the, the general nature of uh, the, the climate that we're in right now, uh, is there anything that remote monitoring or items like that might be able to help us out with? Uh, Obviously, the dose is a really interesting thing, but maybe remote monitoring has some answers there as well. Sure, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, we've been seeing a lot actually on TV lately about um, the CDC saying that this could be kind of phase one and we could be seeing this again next year. We got caught unaware this time. This came absolutely out, absolutely out of nowhere and now we have the opportunity to get ready for next year. So I think that's important to know. We are trying to get ready to do a lot of things fast and a lot of the devices that we showed you are going to get, uh, get today's challenge taken care of today. But let's go ahead and, and look at the long term too. So the question that you're actually asking, Sean, is so yes, with the use of door sensors and window sensors and alert buttons in the home along with some of the different video devices. <clears throat> uh, again, on what Elena was saying too, these can be set up via uh, Wi-Fi or cellular, but this is going to get us ready to give people the opportunity to alert staff when they need them, if staff isn't going to be available, if other caregivers for people uh, who are using natural supports, if, if they're not going to be available to be in the home, we can help have some assurances. And more importantly, the people who are, are living in the home can feel comfortable and have a sense of safety with those assurances that they are going to be taken care of and their calls are going to be answered when they need something. Otherwise, if they're anything uh, like I am, if I don't need you, leave me alone. Uh, but there are there are, there are a number of different ways to put those uh, assurances in place, and the traditional remote monitoring is still one of the best uh, and most straightforward ways we can do that. Great, thanks for that answer. And as far as those remote supports are concerned, um, I know that I always advocate building from a a, a low tech base into uh, anything else that's required for that individual. So when we're talking about remote supports, we can certainly be talking about, you know, a, a, a big system uh, that ends up using sensors, that ends up using a lot of, of different things. But in a lot of cases, um, 
a, a good solution for many people is a really simple call button, right? Uh, and being able to work up from something like that, especially as we work through these times where we want to make sure that we're providing services exactly when those services are needed, uh, that, that can also be a, a good way to start stuff out. I think you're absolutely right on that. I had mentioned the personal emergency response button earlier, and there are a number of different ways to do that. There are the buttons and watches that'll go directly to a caregiver, and there are the buttons that'll go to a response center first. Um, some of those buttons, as uh, many of the traditional ones that we've seen are based in the home or connected to a home phone line, and those are wonderful. The person is basically tethered to a certain area around the home. Uh, and then we also have devices with GPS. Uh, there are a couple of questions I always have on those. One of them being, is, is the GPS necessary? Yeah, if the person is going to be taking this out with them, I think it's great to, to be able to find them if they do push the button and they're around. The second question, um, that I get is, do we really want to reach out to a call center uh, or isn't it enough to reach out to a caregiver? And my response on that is generally, let's do the call center. That way we know that somebody is answering every time they push that button, somebody will answer the phone. And then the response center will then call out to a caregiver and say, um, Elaine or Joe just gave me a call, here's the situation and everything's okay, or they need your help right away, or um, I'm notifying you that I just called EMS and they're on their way over to the home. So it's, it's a personal decision all the way up from the lower technology to, to the higher use systems. And I know I'm, I'm giving a long answer here. Um, and it's, it's highly personalized. So a discussion, uh, everything, everything starts with a good discussion. Um, I, don't, I don't love the, the kind of off the cuff, let's go with this and let's just do this. No, let's, let's have a good discussion about it first and, and talk about some of the different, um, the different aspects of the person's personality and environment. Absolutely, and that's, uh, if, any of you decide to visit the uh, Technology Resource Center, uh, you'll see everywhere uh, the very first step is always have the conversation, how to start the conversation, how to get other people on board, how to get the entire interdisciplinary team on board, how it, it all starts with that first initial item and making sure that you can provide the correct support at the correct time for the correct person. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a quick question for the uh, Center for Independent Living. It looks like um, there's a number of you on the call, and it looks like you're from different areas. Is there uh, anything else that we should know about those different areas that you guys support? And if I'm from different places and not necessarily southwestern or southeastern Minnesota, is, are there other places that I can contact? Yeah. Um so for the entire state of Minnesota, there are eight different centers for independent living. We all serve individuals of all ages at any point in time with, that identify as having any disability. So with that in mind, we do have specific catchment areas that, that we provide services in. So there is um, an independent living directory that I'd be happy to make accessible for people so that they could find their designated center for independent living and then reach out for, for those supports. So um, we're able to provide a variety of independent living skills in addition to accessibility um, and assistive technology. I'd like to add that, I mean, <clears throat> if you're not sure where to start and you can only find one, if you're, I mean, if you're from Duluth, but, um, the first one that pops up is the Southwest Center for Independent Living. Give us a call. Mm -hmm. Sean, if I may, I'd like to jump in with a question because I get phone calls all the time about augmentative communication. Mm -hmm. uh, and being an right. AP and EAS, I do not work with augmentative communication 
uh, for the most part, because I am not a speech language pathologist. Uh, Bridget, I'm putting you on the spot here, and she doesn't she didn't know I was going to ask this. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the process on who to get a hold of or Sue, uh, yeah. who to get a hold of and how to start this process for augmentative communication? Um, I can go really quick and then Bridget while she gets on. Um, so you can work with a speech therapist that's an outpatient speech therapist, or you can work with a school speech therapist, or through technology for home, or there are some in-home speech therapists. You need to have an assessment done by a speech therapist who is not a vendor for um, a company. And they need to do an assessment that looks at a variety of devices and rules in and out. So you uh, get the device that's best for the person. And then that speech therapist would work with a vendor. Um, and that vendor then would become involved to do trials of the product to make sure that it is the right product. And then if it is a speech therapist does need to write up a quite lengthy report to get medical assistance or Medicare to pay for the device, but it is something that Medicare and medical assistance do pay for. And then Bridget, you can add to that. Hi, I sure can. Um, and I would say what Sue said, um, I get a fair number of calls from um, social workers around the state who the, the piece that that seems to be the disconnect for folks is getting them connected with a speech language pathologist um, hopefully who understands augmentative communication and and can kind of walk you through that process and there are a number around the state as Sue mentioned so your school speech language pathologist a independent private practice speech therapist um, outpatient speech therapist. So it's it's getting them connected. And Sue, I imagine that you have lists too for people yep. that you can't reach. I know the Minnesota STAR program has a list of speech therapists who do AAC evals. And then I, I work um, with a vendor and then at the point that they're needing access to devices for trials, that's when typically when a vendor will get involved. Fantastic. All right. So we do have a hand raised from one of our attendees. Uh, once again, feel free if those of you that are uh, on a computer interface, you can raise your hand as well and I will uh, allow the unmute. Um, if you have any other questions, uh, go ahead and click on that Q&A double bubble uh, and type your question in and we'll get to you as soon as possible. So Jamie, let's go ahead and hear your question if possible. Um, I am doing the best, you can, yeah. the best that I can here. It looks like I was able to unmute you and then I wasn't able to unmute you. Uh -oh. Unmute. All right. Well, I gave it a shot. Jamie, if you could use that, uh, the Q and A, um, feature, that would be great. Uh, and we will get to your question as quick as we can. Uh, I do have a number of other ones that have come in. Uh, one to Elena, uh, what is the cost of the DOSE program? Um, so for the medication dispenser, as I mentioned, it's fully covered by all Medicaid waiver programs here in Minnesota, um, and it is $60 per month. So that includes literally everything that you'll need. Um, so that's the medication dispenser itself, which would be a rental. So if it's ever dropped or broken or anything like that, it would be replaced by us. And we do actually include up to two devices. And we do that specifically to handle more complex med schedules like medications three to four times per day. Um, so essentially medications are filled for at least a whole week at a time. We've even had some people in response to COVID ask for two devices for somebody taking medications two times per day because that keeps them set up in the medication dispensers for a full two weeks at a time. So if they need two devices, that's not an additional cost. It's included in that $60 per month pricing, as well as then as many of these additional trays as needed. We've had somebody ask us for eight for somebody. And so you can have as many of these as you need. Please do not hesitate to ask for them, um, as well as any adaptive equipment. So we've got the adaptive flipper. We've got some other adaptive equipment I didn't show initially, but a stand to angle the screen up for somebody who's deaf or hard of hearing that would need to see the flashing light easily directed at their face and then some other equipment to help with filling the medications into the med trays. 
Um, so really anything needed, including at all times, all of our other services like the health reminders, um, if needed. Again, those are entirely free. You don't need a medication dispenser right now. You don't need anything. You don't need to be involved with those in any way to be set up with those medication reminders or health or activity reminders right now. So as far as that cost is concerned, though, uh, if I'm a service provider and I'm looking at trying to get one of these set up for an individual that I'm supporting, um, and $60 per month is not necessarily in my personal ability to pay, what are some options that I have? <laughs> Great question. Um, so I think the biggest thing really is seeing if this is a system that you're going to be setting up for the individuals to be more involved with their medication passing. Um, it's really important, as Anna actually mentioned at the start of this webinar, Minnesota DHS has really started to see the use of technologies like the medication dispenser for individuals who are receiving care with staff in a home. Um, one of the things that we, we like to stress is independence does not mean, and Anna said this really well, that that person is on the verge of moving out into their own home or already living in their own home. We have worked with individuals who simply their staff does almost everything by getting them set up with the medication dispensers, putting it into the adaptive flipper, and then that individual's coming in and self-administering the medications by flipping it over and dispensing it in the cup. And that alone has made such a big difference for those individuals because that new level of independence is something that they didn't have before. Now they get to actively be involved with their daily medication passing rather than passively being told it's time to take your medication, here they are. Um, so that can make a huge difference for an individual. And with that, as long as it's being utilized as that tool for independence, the waivers will pay for it. Um, that's, and I can, I can have Anna reiterate that on her end. Um, it's not considered a duplication of service when it's being utilized to involve the individual more in their independence. So I would always say as a provider, looking to get the individual more involved and finding individuals who would be a good fit for that will allow the waivers to help pay and cover the costs for the services. Mm -hmm. um, other options are we can, we can do private pay, that's an option. Um, if an individual is not covered under a waiver, it's still the same cost, still includes everything that it would on the waivers or not. Um, and for private insurances and other options like that, it's really dependent on each individual's plan. So I would just recommend reaching out to the insurance provider to see if they would cover it. What we've been told when we've called multiple insurance providers is it's a pretty rare code that would be assistive technology being billable on their plan. So that's kind of the, the key indicator. We've seen it very rarely, unfortunately, but anything we can do to help to and advocate with the insurance provider, we will. Sometimes it does help if you can get a letter recommendation from a doctor or prescription written as well. Yeah, and I just wanted to add to that about it, it um, uh, not being a duplication. And in addition to that, we sometimes have case managers who think that then if they if they auth authorize some sort of assistive uh, technology that um, decreases somebody's reliance on staff, or that's the hope that it will, they think that they need to decrease the staffing hours um, to coincide with that e equipment. And I always um, caution people on doing that because, um, you know, um, ultimately sometimes when people do start using new technology, they might actually need more staff assistance initially. Um, and um, they, they might need more staff, and, and it might not work. <laughs> it might not end up being an effective tool for the person, or maybe the person might not, you know, end up liking it. They thought they wanted to do this. And so then you're in a situation where you have to then, you know, redo the service authorization again and everything. So I always tell people just to leave the, the service authorization um, alone, uh, at least for a, a period of time to um, allow for the, that learning curve and allow time um, for the person to get um, comfortable with it. And then if it makes sense, then, you know, at that point, later on to decrease staff time because the person is now um, independent with it, then, then that would be the time to do it, but not to do it like simultaneously. Yeah. Absolutely. And that comes right back to what we were talking about before and what we go at so 
much within the technology resource centers. Make sure that you're having that conversation. Make sure everybody's on board, especially the individual that you're supporting with the support that you're looking to implement, right? We wanna make sure that the exact or as close to the uh, exact right support that we can get is being utilized. And that only comes from making sure that everybody is on the same page and everybody is on board with using it. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, just coming off of uh, that dose conversation, getting a number of other ones, uh, what happens if, some, uh, if someone loses the trays or some of the equipment? What's the cost for the replacement? That is a wonderful question. Um, so the only thing that would be lost and would be charged a fee would be the medication dispenser itself. If the extra trays or the adaptive equipment are lost, that, that would be no cost. Um, it is a $300 fee if the machines are not returned to us, but that does not, if somebody like breaks it, you know, even to an extent, if they get angry and check it across the room, which we've, we've seen rarely, um, as long as we can receive pieces back of the devices, the way we like to put it, we'll replace it. Obviously within reason, if we're seeing that three times a month, that's going to be a little different, but um, for law or non-return devices. It is that $300 fee. We've been very fortunate that the waivers for the most part are able to cover that. Um, it is really not something that we're assessing to the individual themselves because we understand that that's pretty costly and if, if they're on a waiver especially that's going to be difficult to afford to pay. So hope that answers the question. Very good. Thank you. Uh, here's a here's an interesting one. Uh, are there any state guidelines on how to sanitize devices between uses, uh, particularly in congregate care? I'm wondering if any of you have heard anything about that. And I think that opens up to really any kind of device that's being utilized. Uh, if it is something that's, um, that's maybe a shared unit in some cases, uh, if there's any way to sanitize those things. Anna, I don't know if you have any guideline at all, but I sure do not. <laughs> no, I would probably just direct them to the Department of Health website or CDC guidelines. Um, I don't know specifically right. in regards to aging yeah. devices. So. Yep, I'm not sure either. And in a lot of cases, just to, to be quite frank, uh, when I first started out, I tried my best to get certain items like uh, like iPads and different things like that to be in a group home, not necessarily for a singular person, but but for the folks that are living at that group home. And once again, quite frank, it does not work that well. <laughs> Trying to uh, get people, especially for an assistive device that you want to load with uh, with with apps that are pertinent to a singular individual uh, that might be outfitted with different things that are pertinent to that individual. It, it, it's not, not something that's, that I generally uh, advocate for. Mm -hmm. um, many times these assistive technologies, supportive technologies should be as dialed in as possible to the needs of that individual person. Uh, a lot of times those supports are like a fingerprint. It, it, it really is particular and you want to make sure that they're as close to that person as we can get. All right, let's go back and see if there's any other questions. Once again, guys, that Q&A double bubble is down at the bottom of your ribbon. You can go ahead and click on that. It'll open up your question and answer uh, uh, window and you can type in whatever you'd like. Um, here's one from earlier from uh, Deborah Abner. Um, we have an individual uh, that essentially needs to have prompts uh, to have a given item happen, right? It, for, for this person, it looks like uh, prompts to eat. Um, Matt, you had said earlier uh, that the Nucleus device might be appropriate for that. If there's any other information that you might have on that Nucleus device, it might be good to hear it. And then maybe after that, we can look at uh, maybe any other uh, ways to support that that others might want to share. Thank you, Sean. Uh, the Nucleus device, as we talked about, has a camera on there. The application can be downloaded to a caregiver's computer, a caregiver's tablet, cell phone. Um, 
and they can provide the prompting face-to-face -face is, is what I was reading into the question. We'd like to have a way to talk to the person face-to-face. -face. Otherwise, written prompts can come up on the screen uh, programmed for different times of the day. We can use pictures and automations as well if that will work better for the person instead of having somebody telling them what to do. Um, quickly, another nice uh, aspect of that is we can change the caregivers for different times and it can automatically have on shift and off shift potential. So if we have different staff members scheduled for different days and different times a day, the calls can automatically be routed to those different staff members. This can all be controlled by an administrator within the company. So multiple of these devices can be set up throughout uh, a house or a group of houses as well, if they need to be. For other prompts, some of the remote monitoring systems uh, inherent in those systems as well uh, are verbal prompts that can be set up for different times a day. For example, if somebody leaves the oven on, there can be a verbal prompt that says, don't forget to turn off the oven. I have a young lady who every time she leaves her home in the morning between uh, 7 and 9 a.m., uh, it prompts her to don't for do not forget your insulin, do not forget your lunch, and do not forget to lock the door. And we have been able to since turn off those notifications because in the last couple of months, she has never forgotten her insulin, never forgotten her lunch, and never forgotten to close the door, probably because she was tired of hearing it. <laughs> but it was enough to, to help her remember. So it's over time, um, I'm a big proponent of getting rid of the technology, if we can. Uh, first, we get rid of the caregivers. Well, not get rid of the caregivers. Um, pare down the support as much as we can, and then do the same thing with the technology. If the person doesn't need it, the person doesn't have to have it. But we can always put these back in place if the person, if we do see that the person needs it again. A lot of times with those things, it, what we find is that we're putting things in place to accommodate guardians that are worried about uh, their person failing. And so we put things in place and then gradually take them away so that they become more and more independent and can prove to everybody on the team that they are um, able to be as independent as possible. Kit, that's a fantastic point. I know this is inherent in the dose medication dispenser, as well as a number of the devices I've talked about, including the nucleus and the, and the remote monitoring system. Um, but the data is gathered for every time uh, an event occurs and the time the event occurs. So we know when the person is taking their medication. And I haven't played with Elena's device in a while, but I remember when I was doing it uh, previously, it told me that I had 86% medication adherence over the course of a, of a given month. Um, I wasn't sure whether to be proud of myself or disappointed in myself. But either way, it, it, it told me the days that I, that I did take things on time and the things that I didn't. Uh, there are exportable uh, Excel spreadsheets for a number of these devices. I, I don't, I'm not speaking for the dose on this one. Uh, but on a number of devices where you can either send these out via email or print them off to bring to a team meeting and say, this is exactly what's going on. Uh, so we're not having staff uh, and caregivers give three or four different stories as to their experience with the person. Now we have hard data. Uh, that's especially important when we're speaking of a person going and seeing their neurologist for something like a seizure detection device. Um, or if we're making solid decisions on behalf of a person that's going to affect their life. Uh, we want to go into uh, those conversations with, with all of the data. And I can just add and confirm that we do have the ability to send out any sort of information about how the individual has been using the medication dispenser. Um, so we track that. We can send out reports. Um, if 
case managers or care teams want to receive reports, they can. We also have a dashboard so people can go in and see that information live if they have access and the right to view that information. Um, and, and like I said, too, we even do the live notifications with um, all of our devices have a cellular chip built into them, so there's no requirement to have Wi-Fi or a cell phone or anything to use the devices and get those live notifications. It does that tracking through the device itself. Right. So in a lot of cases, though, I have to have Wi-Fi for stuff like that. And I mean, one of the awesome things about DOS is how portable it is. So do I have to wait for that to reconnect to the Wi-Fi to get any of that or...? No, not at all. So oh. we don't even, our old devices were Wi-Fi enabled. Um, nowadays, it's just an actual cellular chip built into it. So kind of like you're walking around with a cell phone, very, very, very low grade cell phone that you can't make calls from or text anybody from, <laughs> but it will track live. So if you're, if you took the device out of the home and you're using it, um, maybe you're at a restaurant or something like that when restaurants are a thing again for people. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if I dispense my medications and maybe my, my mom was set up to receive a notification when I did dispense my meds, she would still get that notification even though I was away from the home. Um, so basically anywhere you get the cell signal, you're going to be able to get those live notifications. The nice thing too is if you go into an area that doesn't have cell signal, it actually does have a memory storage on the device where it can do essentially a download of all of the information that's happening and do a dump then when it does actually reconnect to cell phone coverage. So we could still have that information tracked in the reporting. Fantastic. And I just can confirm as far as utilizing the, uh, the data dumps, um, not necessarily just in that situation, but uh, Hammer has done some extensive uh, implementation in using uh, dose flips in particular for individuals that we support. Um, both as a means of independence for people, but also now uh, reaching out beyond that independence, looking at how we can implement it within our entire structure of how we give medications at Hammer. Uh, so in a lot of cases now, uh, if an individual is able to independently give their or take their medications, great, we set them up with, with uh, uh, the appropriate medication uh, schedule, but we also are starting to use it with our staff members, where our nurses will actually go out, make sure that the, the flips are filled appropriately, uh, and they set them up. And when it's time to pass those medications, using our EMAR as well as the dose flip, the time comes around, we say, okay, it's time to pass these medications, and the DSP just dumps the medications into a cup. Uh, and it has been fantastic. And then utilizing the big data that comes out of that, uh, big data, you know, uh, wrong use of it, but hey, uh, it's a lot of lines in an Excel document, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I've been able to look at exactly how well that's going on a house-to-house -house basis, on a person-to-person -person basis. If we're seeing some issues, we can dial in and look at the staff members that were uh, working at that point. Um, it's just been a really, really interesting thing. Um, and if you have questions about that, feel free to reach out to me and I can get you hooked up with our uh, director of nursing. Uh, Living, Living Well has been doing the same thing. We got the information from Hammer that they were having such great success. So Living Well Disability Services has been utilizing this also in their group home settings and um, has really helped with uh, staff anxiety and um, and medication errors that revolve around direct service um, administering medications. And so you can also reach out to me and ask me any questions where that's concerned as well. Fantastic. Yeah. It, isn't it awesome to see those medication errors go down? It, it, what a, it's just such a boon for quality of life overall. It, it's, it's a really great thing. So Utilizing dose has been great. Utilizing those, uh, the alternative way to, to pass medications and granted dependence is amazing as well. Shout out to other medication uh, uh, dispensers as well. Dose, obviously, special place in, in my heart. But if that's not the appropriate solution for the individual that you're supporting, there are other items like the MD2 uh, as well as uh, uh, MedMinder. Um, and I've used both of those with success too. Uh, on the MD2, actually, now I'm looking over at the question and answer stuff. Uh, 
just want a confirmation that it is not a duplication to authorize med dispensers. Uh, Anna, how about, how about we just get that one more time, I think? Yes, it would not be a duplication um, to, uh, for someone who is interested in increasing their independence with, with uh, administering their own medications um, to have a med dispenser um, in a group home um, to, be able, to be able to work on that skill. Um, and, you know, and that goes, that can be said for any kind of assistive technology, really. Um, so assistive technology is anything that allows someone to do something for themselves that they would otherwise need uh, a staff or caregiver to do for them. And even prior to um, all things COVID, um, you know, we've had a significant staff shortage issue um, that's not going to get any better. Um, so, and we have legislation that passed in 2017 that requires that teams have a discussion to see if technology can be used to meet someone's needs at their planning meeting. So we really need to get people in the habit of looking to see if there's technology can, that can meet someone's needs in any particular area um, prior to having the first thought in our head be like, oh, we can have a staff <laughs> do that because that's, that's all, not always gonna be an option. So the more comfortable we can get um, people using technology now and, and getting, that, getting those skills in place, um, you know, it's really, the, uh, you know, win-win for all. It allows staff to be um, used in ways that they, they are needed most um, to do things that we don't have technology, at least right now, that, <laughs> that can do. Um, so we really need to maximize that staff time and, and look to ways that we can have people's needs met through technology whenever possible. Yeah. I'd like to jump in just very quickly from a vendor perspective on the uh, duplication of services. We absolutely do not want to bring technology into a person's home that they're not going to utilize. So I keep harping on this, having the conversation about it and really finding if this is an appropriate technology for the person before, before ordering. It's not helping the person, it's not helping us, it's not helping anybody if the device is going to end up in a closet. I have sent out devices before where they remain uncharged for, for a month at a time. And the first thing I do is I get on the case manager, get on the phone with the case manager and I say, why are we paying for this thing? Let's, let's go ahead and either find another option or stop it entirely. We have a finite amount of resources. There's a finite amount of money. We want to, as much as anybody, use this to the best of our ability, to the best uh, benefit of the person who's going to be served. And if it's not going to be benefiting the person, we don't want to use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's why we do a lot of trials. And it's good to have access to like STAR and PACER to do a longer loan program. I think those are really important, especially if someone's on the fence. Um, but in all of our assessments, even our remote assessments, we're uh, remotely trying things, sending that out to the person to have them actually try it with us because that's really important. Yeah. Fantastic. And Anna, just to round out, if somebody is having trouble, uh, whether it's a case manager trying to get it approved or I know that in our circumstance, uh, when as a service provider, we're working with that case manager to try to get approval, um, would it be all right to reach out to you for documentation? Um, yeah, that, that would be fine. Um, I don't I wanna put people, you all the way out there, but. <laughs> yeah, no, so probably the easiest way would be to go through the uh, DSD Response Center. Ah. Um, and you can even specifically reference my name and then they'll, they'll route it to me. There's also a monitoring technology uh, email box that's, that's sometimes used with you know, things more that definitely fall under monitoring technology versus maybe assistive technology, but um, you know, that can be used as well. But probably the easiest way is um, 
you know, um, going through that disability response center and then, you know, referencing my name and then they'll just route it right to me. Fantastic. Sorry, I didn't mean to blow up your inbox if I just did that. No, no, that's okay. That's, <laughs> that's, that's my job. <laughs> All right, we're rounding down here. I can't believe it's already been an hour and a half. Uh, thank you all so much for coming in and hanging out with us. Uh, um, it's been a pleasure communicating with you guys. Are there any last thoughts from uh, any panelists here? Just don't forget that all of us are working right now and you can make a referral and people can get their assistive technology needs met. Yep. Absolutely. And I'm just going to once again share my screen with some of the information. And boom. All right. So once again, uh, thank you to ARM for allowing us to utilize their uh, their Zoom system for today. Um, we might have to convince them to up the, the ante as far as their webinar uh, allowances are concerned. Holy cow, there was a lot of people that wanted to join. Thanks again so much for hanging out with us. Uh, certainly have a look at the Technology Resource Center. A lot of us have put a lot of time and effort into that. Uh, and we, we do our very best to make sure that we're steering you in the right direction. Have a look at that. Guided courses for case managers, service providers, and uh, self-advocates and families. Have a look at our Minnesota NEAT page. Uh, all of our contact information is listed there as well as a number of other items uh, for you to have a look at. Um, let's see, and let us know if there's other topics that you'd be interested in us covering in particular. Of course, this is kind of a broad subject with uh, just assistive technology and remote supports as a whole. Um, but if there's other pointed items, you know, we don't have to try to, uh, to do just like a, a, an overarching thing. We can get a little bit more pointed and see if we can do some research and make sure that we have answers for everything. Uh, we will be posting the video. Um, that's a great question. Is there, we'll probably, we'll be posting it on our website, I'm sure, uh, as far as access. Um, and I'll be seeing what I can do through Zoom uh, to, to get this out to everybody as well. Um, let's see, and I'm rambling, rambling as usual. Is there anything else that I'm missing, crew? That's oh, all. I think so. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, everybody, yes, thank, thank you. you. Keep up the good work. Yep. Yeah. So can, like I said, feel free to reach out to any of us. You'll get all of us. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Have a fantastic day, and thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much.